Hello and welcome to uh, Center on Global Interests uh, panel on uh, history's war. Um, there's been an internet joke running around that in 15 years, uh, Vladimir Putin's greatest achievements um, have been Yuri Gagarin's uh, space flight and victory in World War II. Uh, highlighting the greater importance that um, has been given to history, and some would say reassessment and rewriting of a history under Vladimir Putin, uh, glossing over some of the um, more unpleasant things in Russian history while highlighting uh, some of the um, more positives. As we've seen with the conflict in Ukraine, um, World War II rhetoric um, has become important again. Both sides calling each other fascists, right? The Ukrainian fascists, uh, the Russians, Putin is the new Hitler. So we're very pleased to kind of offer um, two great panels uh, today. One where we'll talk um, a little bit about the historical um, uses of World War II in Russia and uh, other republics, Soviet um, republics. Um, we're very glad to have uh, three wonderful um, experts um, from Columbia University. We have Tariq uh, Suril Amar. He's an assistant professor of history at Columbia University, where he works on the history of the Soviet Union, Russia, Ukraine, and more generally, East uh, Central Europe. His dissertation, The Making of Soviet Lviv, uh, has focused um, on the often violent 20th century transformations of a borderland city uh, known as Lviv and by many, many uh, other names throughout times. Dr. Ama is currently researching the Soviet television series 17 Moments of Spring. He's also working on political and cultural history of Soviet and other Cold War narratives and the presentations of spying, secrecy, and multiple identities. And as I understand, your book will be coming out uh, soon, right? Um, this fall. This fall. So please look out for, uh, for his Thank book. <laughs> uh, also, we have uh, Marek Jan Khodorkiewski, professor of history and the current holder of Kaczewski, chair of Polish Studies Institute of World Politics. Um, he writes weekly columns for the popular Polish press and contributes to the Solos Foundation Internet Hub. He also published on foreign policy in various venues, including Jamestown Foundation's Eurasia Daily Monitor, Journal of World Affairs, National Review Online. His latest books include Intermarium, The Land Between the Black and the Baltic Seas from 2012, and On the Right and the Left from 2013. Also, very uh, pleased to have Kathleen Smith, who's a visiting professor at Georgetown University and a former adjunct professor at George Washington University. Dr. Smith served as a con uh, consultant for the United States Holocaust uh, Memorial Museum in Moscow from uh, 1999 to 2000, and uh, talked a little bit about all the frustrations associated with trying to get uh, into the Soviet archives and getting anything out of them. Um, uh, she's uh, conducted research on Holocaust-related topics in Russian state archives. Her books include Myth-Making in New Russia from Cornell University 2002 and Remembering Stalin's Victims, Cornell University in 1996. So we'll uh, start with um, our panel and also we'll uh, have uh, lunch available um, in, uh, in uh, between the panels and then we'll start with uh, the second panel which will address more contemporary um, uses of World War II. Thank you very much. Ladies first? I, I don't know if you're ever particular. It's, 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 it's all the same to me, so. All right, if I sit. I'm a field officer. Ladies first. Okay. So. All right, well, thanks. <laughs> so, uh, as uh, our host mentioned, I'm an expert uh, on Russia, so I'll be talking a bit about Russian aspects. And what I'd like to start with is to take you back in time, uh, not to ancient history, uh, but to 1992, and in particular, May 9, 1992, which was the first post-Soviet commemoration of Victory Day. And on that first post-Soviet May holiday, uh, two unusual events took place in Moscow. The first was an international parade for peace, and the second was a walkabout in Gorky Park by then-President Boris Yeltsin. Neither of these events, I have to say, was met with much enthusiasm. Indeed, as regards the first, the Russian press uh, complained that the veterans uh, whom Yeltsin met in the park could not afford to even buy a beer at the new commercial kiosks that had sprung up everywhere. And indeed, the veterans themselves uh, harangued Yeltsin with their complaints about rising prices, the falling value of their pensions, and so forth. 
This, in fact, was the last time that I know of that President Yeltsin did a walkabout uh, under any circumstances. So I take it he did not enjoy that experience. Now, as regards the peace parade, uh, the media complained here, too, because they didn't like the fact that a German band marched in the parade in front of Russian veterans. And I think that what bothered them so much was that this ordering muddied the symbolism of the time. That is, Russia were the victors, and they felt uh, quite upset that conditions in Russia were significantly worse than conditions uh, in Germany in the 1990s. And this implied that somehow Germany's economically superior state meant that Russians should take lessons from Germans and not vice versa. So three years later, if we look at Victory Day, things had really changed. Uh, one could once again find the leader of the state atop of Lenin's mausoleum uh, with a slew of foreign dignitaries reviewing a military parade on Red Square. Now, I would note that just as with this current Victory Day parade, uh, there was a somewhat disappointing response to the invitations that Russia had issued. And at that moment in time in uh, 1995, it was because the first Chechen war was ongoing and Russian dipl or Western diplomats and politicians were uncomfortable being on the reviewing stand if units that were active in Chechnya were participating. But Yeltsin, always the affable host, accommodated them. He had two parades, a historic parade and a contemporary parade so that you know, the diplomats could go to one. So as you can see from these two examples, uh, the commemoration of Victory Day is, I think, an excellent lens for looking at the ways in which state memories and popular memory practices intersect. And so what I want to do today, just uh, in this short uh, period of time, is talk a little bit about how the use of memory of the war by Russian leaders has changed. I also want to talk about how the narrative uh, dissonance that is generated by the experience of war versus the occasion of victory, how that affects the way that memory of the war is used. And then lastly, I want to finish by talking about how political and generational change, I think, is going to change uh, collective memory practices going forward. OK, so let me start by saying just a little bit about the salience of Victory Day and why this was a problematic holiday in the 1990s. So for the Soviet Union, the number one event in their commemorative calendar, right, the date, historical dates that they remembered, was not surprisingly November 7th, the anniversary of the great October Revolution. October, November, that's a long story. I can't explain it here. Um, but May 9th, the anniversary of victory, was, I would argue, much dearer to the hearts of Soviet citizens. It was a much more emotional day, carrying with it both the euphoria of victory and also memories of the tremendous losses of the war. Now, interestingly, uh, a few years after the war's end, Stalin actually made May 9th a working holiday. So it wasn't a day that you got off work. Uh, but I think we don't really remember that. What we remember is the Brezhnev period, when Victory Day was a major state holiday with showy military parades uh, and many reminders of the accomplishments of the Soviet people, of course, under the guidance uh, of the Communist Party. Now, in the late Soviet days, these uh, public practices, these big parades, uh, were accompanied by many you know, millions of smaller celebrations. And these were family reunions, uh, veterans meeting in local parks where they would often organize themselves by unit or by which front they had served on. And they would be uh, telling stories, recalling the dead, uh, drinking, and so forth. And I think here, the reason I dwell on this for a minute is just to say that you can see that there was sort of a latent conflict between the official happy memory of victory and the actual lived experience of the war, which uh, included victory, but also included the experience of war. So uh, as I write about in my book on myth-making in the new Russia, um, in the 1990s, there was some confusion about what do you do with a Soviet holiday in a new, ostensibly democratic state. And the Russian government faced two problems here. First is that Yeltsin uh, and the so-called Democrats rejected the totalitarian styling of the old Soviet regime. So for them, 
you know, big banners, big parades, etc. That was what totalitarian states do. And so they needed to come up with a new means uh, for marking important days and new symbols. What did you show on Victory Day? The tricolor? The old red banner? Uh, it was a problem for them. And the second problem they faced was that the very process of perestroika and reform had cast a strong light on the past and it had raised a number of troubling aspects of the war itself, including the state's sometimes harsh treatment of veterans. So if you think back to perestroika, issues came up about the state's military preparedness, especially given Stalin's purges of the military, uh, that there was confirmation of the existence of the secret protocols to the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, which the Soviet state had long denied. There were a lot of facts about deportations of the English, Chechens, Crimean Tatars, and so forth. And a lot came out about the way that the Soviet state used filta sorry, filtration camps after the war to examine uh, surviving POWs and the surviving Arbeiters, that is, citizens of Russia, uh, Soviet Union, Ukraine, who had been drafted into forced labor in Germany. And many of those people ended up doing, uh, as the Russians would say, a second tour uh, in a different set of camps. So in the early 90s, I would say commemorations were kind of muted and fragmented for both of these reasons. There wasn't a new form and there wasn't a full narrative of what the war meant nowadays. And the liberal media kind of backed this up. For instance, uh, when they would publish articles about what to do on Victory Day. They would always tell multiple stories. One person was gonna reunite you know, with a sister from Belarus, another person was gonna drink with his friends, a third was gonna take the grandchildren out for a walk, you know, replete uh, with his medals and so forth. Um, and the politicians too, in part, uh, bought into these sort of more populist ways of celebrating Victory Day. So I argue in my book that in the 90s, you could see a division among politicians about the holiday. And this was most evident in Moscow, the home of national politics, where liberal politicians went to the newly finished uh, Victory Park, Park Pobiedi, where they made speeches among uh, what one could politely call a symbolic mishmash. So under Brezhnev, they never quite finished this park, but under Mayor Lushkov, they finished it with such things as St. George slaying the dragon, an obelisk uh, with a figure of Nike, uh, a god almost entirely unfamiliar to Soviet soldiers. Uh, and in fact, obviously, we know it from the sneakers and not so much you know, from Greek legends. So if that's where the liberals were, uh, the communists uh, were in the main streets having parades because that's what they thought was the appropriate way to celebrate the holiday. And at these parades, you could certainly see a replete airing of Soviet banners, symbols, portraits of Stalin, and so forth. The media, and I think people in general, complained that the veterans were divided. They didn't know where to go. They didn't want to have to choose between these narratives. All right, let's fast forward, though. I want to compare 1995 uh, and 2005. So by 1995, among politicians, the competition for being a patriot had heated up. And so the jubilee anniversary of the end of World War II uh, was not going to be celebrated with a priest parade and beer uh, in the park. And so Yeltsin puts on a serious uh, military parade for 1995, and at it, he allows the, and they use this word, not ironically, the rehabilitation of Soviet symbols, uh, victory banner, uh, red flag with a yellow star, and in his speech, he emphasized the unity of generations. So regardless of political regime change, it's still us, it's still our memory. It doesn't have to be tossed out with the other debris uh, of the Soviet Union. But I would say here that in narrative terms, uh, Yeltsin still kind of stuck a bit to the critical narrative that had emerged under Perestroika. And that is that the Russian people won the war in spite of and not because of Stalin. That was the closest he came, uh, perhaps to having an official narrative. All right, fast forward to 2005. For the 60th anniversary of the war, Putin showed that he was not uncomfortable with state pomp. He didn't have that sort of allergy or aversion uh, to showy celebrations and indeed uh, made a massive celebration with um, huge presence of foreign dignitaries and delegations. And in fact, the 
celebrations were so substantial, and the security also, <coughs> that ordinary Muscovites were advised to spend the holidays outside of the city. Like, go to your dacha. You will not be able to ride the metro. You know, this is a big deal. Um, and the reception to this holiday was mixed, so I'll give you two examples. Uh, the head of the Duma Committee on Foreign Affairs said, this was not just a Moscow or even a Russian or post-Soviet event, but a world event. So for him, it was a point of pride that Russia had reestablished itself as the place to mark this anniversary. But other people missed the populist touch. Uh, I'm not generally a fan of the nationalist Alexander Prakhanov, but he complained, I think, quite uh, pithily that it turned out to be a holiday not for the people, but for the authorities. There was a sense that an attraction had been built, not even for Putin, but in honor of Bush, Schroeder, Chirac, and Berlusconi. So this is something to think about today when Putin once again is staging an attraction. Uh, who is his audience for this? So uh, I would say that the holiday coming up is not going to be populist in most of its aspects. The exception is this new uh, habit of wearing the orange and black ribbon that you've all seen, Gyorgyzkaya Lenta. Yeah, so this St. George ribbon is interesting. It was part of a military decoration from the time of Catherine the Great, and it was revived during World War II and used in a particular medal that uh, honored personal valor. And in 2005, so this last big jubilee year, uh, there was an action, uh, which is what the Russian state calls these sort of half civil society, half state uh, events that they do. So there was an action called I Remember and I'm Proud, and it urged people uh, to wear this ribbon, to tie it onto purses, car antennas, uh, and so forth. So now, 2015, the wearing of this ribbon has become uh, quite uh, the norm, and in fact, people are given this ribbon in their workplaces, and I would say there's even some pressure uh, to conform by wearing this ribbon. So what can we conclude from this? Uh, obviously, as the wearing of the ribbon shows, Victory Day remains an incredibly meaningful part of the commemorative calendar in Russia. The passing of the generation of veterans uh, has not diminished this at all. But I would say that the memory of war has flexibility inherent in it. So at critical moments, for instance, in the Yeltsin era, you could promote this narrative in which we were honoring ordinary soldiers and we were remembering the tragedies, the early defeats uh, of the war alongside victory. At times, we remember the war as a time of US-Russian alliance with the meeting at the Elba. At present, though, I would say that the focus is on the suffering of the country rather than on the suffering of its individual people. And the narrative is concentrated on depicting the Soviet Union slash Russia as unfairly isolated from the West, hence trapped into making the inglorious Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact having lost the largest number of uh, soldiers, and having in the post-war era somehow unfairly been trapped into a Cold War in which Russia was uh, mistrusted and isolated by the West. So in some ways, this narrative does mirror part of the victim narrative of the early 1990s. The difference being that Putin's Russia, having put out the victim, this victimization narrative, uh, is victim no longer, right? The spin to the story is now Russia has once again taken its rightful place and is wisely on guard against false friends. Uh, and with this narrative, that initial confusion about how to celebrate the day has been swept aside. Now, and here one always has to try and look for some positives uh, in studying Russian history so that the audience does not weep. So I have some positives. Um, and here what I would say is that if there's anything I've learned from studying so-called history wars around the world, it's that narratives and memorial practices are not static. They really do change. And collective memory, especially of an event like this that touched the entire nation, can't be the exclusive property of one political party or faction. So although some people have argued that younger generations today are particularly open to manipulation, that they'll just swallow whatever the Putin regime tells them because they themselves don't remember the war, uh, I really don't think that's true. And in fact, I think there's an interesting distinction between the way that Putin's generation, that is the generation of children of survivors of the war, and the generation of grandchildren uh, is engaged in collective memory. So let me give you an example about Putin. 
Putin is only one generation removed from the war. So even though he's born in 1952, he's born to older parents who were both adults during the war. And recently, uh, just like a week ago, he had an essay for the website Ruski Pioneer, Russian Pioneer, which despite its name is not for children. At first I thought, oh, it must be a children's, you know, but no, it's not, it's for grown-ups. So. Anyway, he starts this essay uh, this way. He says, my father, to be honest, did not like to talk about this topic. Really, it was more like this. When the adults were conversing among themselves and recalling something or another, I simply happened to be nearby. All my information about the war, about what happened to my family, I got from these conversations of the grown-ups among themselves. Sometimes they spoke to me directly. So Catherine Meridale, in her wonderful book, Yvonne's War, found a very similar pattern. The stories of the war were horrific and they were not for children's ears, and they were not really to be repeated. These are not stories in which necessarily one thinks of glorious victory, dying with Stalin's names on one breath. They're tragedies. So in Putin's case, the fragments that he overheard, including his father uh, escaping death as a member of a special ops team by lying underwater in a marsh and breathing through a straw, his sacrifice of his own rations when he was it's the father's own rations when he was in the hospital so that uh, Putin's mother could feed uh, their child. His brother at age three forcibly being evacuated from Leningrad and subsequently dying of diphtheria with his parents never being told where their child was buried. Um, and then finally, his father's miraculous intervention as his wife's uh, seeming corpse is being carried to be thrown out with other corpses during the blockade uh, and the father realizes that she's not quite dead, you know, and saves her from this fate. So in his essay, Putin reports that as president, he was able to check and confirm details of his father's service and even find burial information for his brother. But the way that he tells these war stories, which for him are a point of pride, stoicism, and sacrifice of his parents, to me remind me of this conflict between tales of the darker suffering uh, that took place during the war and the straightforward narratives uh, that patriotic films offered. So is it any wonder that Putin grew up loving movies about catching spies uh, and you know saving the day uh, when he didn't have such a clear narrative as a child? So what about the grandchildren? Uh, and I'm gonna finish here by pointing out that there's an amazing contest for high schoolers held every year sponsored by the Memorial Society and it's called Lessons from the History of the 20th Century. You can go online or you buy their publications. They publish the winning essays every year. So what they've done is encourage and train teachers and students to do research on their communities, to collect oral histories, to examine their family papers, and so forth. And this contest every year produces remarkable works in which you can find both patriotic pride and complexity coexisting. So for instance, in 2014, one of the top project had the title, Life Was Typical, Tragic and Wonderful, which I, who, can, who can say it better than that, right? And this is a high schooler who's come up with this great title. And it was a project on oral history with a student's grandmother whose father was repressed during the purges. The family lived in Stalingrad. Her mother did not want to leave the city as the German forces approach because she thought, if we leave this apartment and he's alive somewhere, he'll never find us, right? But fortunately for her, the NKVD forced them out because they didn't want families of enemies of the people to be anywhere near the German troops. So they, so they lived, right? That's the typical, wonderful, tragic, all wrapped up. This year, one of the best projects, I think, was an analysis of a handwritten book of songs that was collected in a filtration camp by a Soviet POW, uh, a Russian, and his girlfriend, an Ostarbeiter from Ukraine. So the sad part is that they were separated in this process of the filtration camp and never found each other again. But this book in which they wrote down the Chastushki and informal songs that the Ostarbeiters and POWs had sang survived in a school museum. And now it's been digitized and translated and so forth. So I think many Russian people share that dual state where private memories aren't necessarily a good match for the polished, showy displays of military might. And my hope is that with this new generation, what we'll see is that they're gonna overcome the fear of revealing family secrets, and they're gonna have that distance necessary for critical thinking. And so my hope is that perhaps in some less politicized future,
they will be able to sort out and combine myth and reality without being accused of undermining notions of patriotism. Thanks. Is yours. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, just saying, I get this mic close. Uh, can you hear me? Is that all, all right? Um, so, I'm going to uh, speak about uh, Ukraine, actually, um, which, of course, was or has often been called, and I think was the Second Republic the second most important republic of the Soviet Union, um, is now, of course, already independent for uh, almost 25 years, and um, is at this point, unfortunately, the site of a very severe crisis that involves both Russia and Ukraine, and that also, as, as I hope I can show, has certain reverberations and connections to um, the politics of history and the politics of memory, and in particular perhaps not only, not only uh, as a context, but in particular to the politics of history and memory of the Second World War. Um, I should perhaps also say, I think this is rather important, that when I say I'm speaking about Ukraine today, um, First of all, I, I, although I'm on this panel, it will be a fairly contemporary talk. Um, the politics I talk about are the politics now, or at least since Ukrainian independence. That also has a certain history, of course, by now. Um, secondly, quite importantly, um, when I say Ukraine, uh, I am talking about um, essentially um, policies, politics, discussions, uh, having to do with the government in Kiev and with the territories and the population uh, ruled by it effectively. Um, I do, of course, not want to say thereby that um, the parts of Ukraine that are now under de facto uh, occupation by either or and Russia and the separatists um, are somehow not, no longer part of Ukraine. Um, there are, in fact, already signs of them developing their own um, history and memory politics. Uh, there are small examples, small in a sense, but uh, also t disturbing, very disturbing, such as a memory plaque newly established to Stalin in Crimea, uh, or recently um, analyzed in a, in a fairly good article in the New York Times, um, uh, policies in the eastern part of the Ukrainian part of Donbass that is under separatist tribal control that try once again to relativize, um, I would almost say, half deny um, the famine and the, uh, the mass killing nature of the famine of 1932 and 33. So, um, of course, these are Ukrainian territories. They are not under the control of the Kiev government because of illegal reasons. Um, however, I will restrict my talks for practical purposes, really, uh, to uh, Kiev and, and the society and the territory it, it controls, uh, fortunately. Now, um, as, uh, as uh, um, has already been said, there's um, a balance of the negative and the positive and in, in the Russian case, one has to be careful to not, especially currently uh, under, under the Putin regime, um, only uh, pronounce on, on the negative. There is so much of it, very clearly. Um, personally, I think there has been a lot of it for a very long time, much longer than uh, a lot of observers deemed to notice. Um, in the Ukrainian case, um, we have, of course, although the situation is as dire as it is, and I won't go into the details here, that's not our topic, you all know it from the media, I think, uh, we have a lot of positive developments. We also have a lot of sympathy, right? Um, there is an element of uh, David fighting against Goliath here. There is an element of um, an underdog defending 
themselves against um, a massive and very brutal intervention. Uh, my personal take is that there is no doubt that there is massive Russian intervention, of course. There is a Russian de facto, if limited, invasion. It could have been much worse again. Uh, there also is, however, as I would like to stress, although some people like to deny this, there are genuine elements of civil war in Ukraine. And I'm afraid, as a historian, I have to insist that things are more complex than uh, op-ed writers sometimes want them to be. Acknowledging Russian aggression does not mean that there are no real separatists. And pointing out that there are real separatists, and <coughs> politologists say he, Kudelia, has done excellent work on them, does not in any way mean endorsing what they do. It simply is an analytical question. There is a very untidy mixture here. Not unprecedented, it has happened before in history, of civil war, warfare from outside, hybrid war. It's all a combination. Um, anyhow, in spite of all of this, when it comes to Ukraine, we have, of course, clearly positive developments. The kleptocratic regime of uh, Yanukovych has fallen. Um, at high cost, but it has fallen. It has been replaced by a regime that holds real elections. That's a big advance. We are, in that sense, back to the period 2004-05 to 2010, um, at least. Uh, we have um, seen many other positive developments, and I leave them out. In the case of history and memory politics, we have a clear turn away for the better from the history and memory politics of the Yanukovych era, which were marked especially by the um, uh, interventions of then Minister Tabachnik, uh, which were extremely neo-Soviet and um, engaged in what I would call neo-Soviet myth-making and extremely aggressively guided against uh, important parts, I would say, of Ukrainian national identity. Um, these are all positive developments. When it comes to the Second World War, to be a bit more specific, again, we can see positive developments. One of them very clearly is um, that the concept of the Great Fatherland War uh, is now being massively queried and questioned in public. In fact, the state, the government, is adopting the position that the Great Fatherland War is not the lens through which to see the Second World War. So we are uh, opening up towards a more comprehensive and therefore at least potentially more honest reading of the experience of World War II that, goes, uh, that, that acknowledges that World War II is a chain of events at least between 39 and 45, certainly not just between 41 and 45, which is of course a central part of the Great Father and War myth, which thereby has always tried to deny the fact that there was a Molotov, Ribbentrop, or Stalin-Hitler division of Europe, that there was de facto collaboration between the, Soviet, the Stalinist Soviet Union and, um, and Nazi Germany for um, the first two years, basically, of the war in Europe. These are positive developments. Um, you can see um, some of this in concrete terms in the way that the government handles the anniversaries. Um, the government has found, as I find in this, in this regard, a sensible, uh, constructive compromise. It has not abolished May the 9th, which of course stands for the Great Fatherland War anniversary, although it's no longer officially called that, but everybody remembers that this Gen Pabiede, or in, in uh, Ukrainian Den Peremohe, is, um, is really comes out of the Soviet tradition. It has not abolished this day, but it has added another day, the 8th of May, which of course then links up to the Western tradition implicitly, because that's what we in the West usually do. Um, that 8th of May is, um, uh, I, I should remember the exact title, it's, uh, don't quote me on this, but it's something like Day of Recon Memory and or Commemoration and uh, Reconciliation. That's its official title. And um, the way it's supposed to function is that um, that day, Poroshenko explained this himself in an interview, is particularly dedicated to victims of the war and everything that came with it, whereas the remaining, as it were, 9th of May is supposed to be particularly dedicated to the veterans. Uh, a wise decision, I think. It also implies, of course, that as the veterans naturally decrease in numbers all the time. 
that the 8th of May is over time going to be ever more important and the 9th of May relatively is going to decline in importance because there won't be veterans alive um, uh, after a relatively short time. Uh, at the same time, the day of the Defender of the Fatherland has been abolished. I think it was 23rd of February. Everybody remembered that as a very Soviet day. How this is, how this is going to work out is, is difficult to say because it's actually a very popular holiday. It used to be a very popular holiday. Uh, simply, you know, for the reasons that it was treated sort of like a Father's Day, right? It's uh, when, when dads have a drink and all that and carouse. But on the other hand, these things can be shifted, and I'm sure that popular culture can actually quite easily adapt to this. Um, uh, there is, of course, also the fact that um, we have, in general, um, uh, an accommodation um, of the enormous losses that the Second World War has really brought to Ukraine. And we have an accommodation or an opening up, an official now opening up to the facts that these enormous losses, as has been stressed by, for instance, Tim Snyder, but not only, were coming really from two sides, at least. We will have to speak more about that. Uh, but they were at least coming from two sides, and that is Nazi Germany, but also the Stalinist Soviet Union. In that respect, of course, this, this type of reframing, uh, I don't want to use the term revision here because it's ambiguous, but this type of reframing, rethinking of the Second World War belongs into a larger context. It belongs into the context of also thinking in new terms about, as I mentioned before, the famine of 1932 33 um, It, uh, of course, also involves, and this is actually very explicit, in current government policy, a rethinking of the experiences of what we call the Russian Revolution, uh, and then the civil wars that actually followed after this, so really the period 1917, uh, 19, say, 2021. Um, uh, it, to an extent, I think, will even reflect on the experiences of World War I, but, but let's not get so far. Um, and of course, there are other um, issues such as a, as a smaller but still also uh, important post-war famine, uh, the repression of the Ukrainian intelligentsia and many other Ukrainians in the 30s, and so on, and so on, and so on. All of these things form in many ways a whole, but clearly the war, the Second World War, is, is a central point here. It's, a, it's one of the most important issues. Now, having said all of this, um, it's a bit the other way around than with Russia, perhaps. One should really be careful, as I said before, not to simply and only sympathize and not to be pushed, I think, by Putin's aggressive policy into an uncritical and, as I think, unhelpful, unhelpful toward Ukraine, agreement with everything that the Ukrainian leadership does. That simply doesn't make sense. I also don't think it's a good form of friendship, actually. Um, uh, to be friends with Ukraine, I think, includes to also think critically about what the Ukrainian governments do, and the Ukraine will need that sort of critical thinking, and a lot of Ukrainians actually think critically about what Ukrainian governments do, and we should not, as it were, disavow that part of Ukrainian society. Now, what, what are the things that, if I wouldn't call them negative, I would say uh, debatable, or I personally think uh, disturbing that also need to be talked about, uh, in particular with respect once again to memory, history, politics. Um, first of all, full disclosure, um, I'm going to speak about the laws that were passed by the Ukrainian parliament rather with overwhelming majorities on the 9th of April, four laws, I will explain what they are. There has been a protest by um, a number, of, I think 70 of, of historians, many of them much more eminent than, than I could ever claim to be, uh, against these laws. It's an international protest. It also includes Ukrainian historians, of course. And I'm one of the signers. So in, in the spirit of full disclosure, I, of course, strive to be objective. But I think you, you should also know that as, as the audience to, to my remarks on the laws. Um, now, um, these laws um, are an attempt uh, to regulate um, public narratives about history and memory 
in Ukraine. They are also an attempt even to regulate academic and research narratives and agendas. This has been denied by some of the commentators defending them. That is actually incorrect. It will have an effect if they are signed by the president also on academic research more narrowly conceived. They certainly will have a massive effect on the public sphere more broadly conceived. Now, um, before going through the laws, and I think one has to be, how much time do I have left? Not that I. Okay, okay. Um, has to be a bit um, specific here, so bear with me. I, I want to summarize their main points, what they do, so to speak. Bear in mind, these are four laws, and I'm giving you a very um, uh, reduced skeleton key sketch of, of what they're about. First of all, they directly equate uh, the Nazi and the Soviet regimes under the rubric of totalitarianism, of course. Um, I should point out that they do not equate the Nazi and Stalinist regime. Uh, they equate the Nazi and Soviet regimes. Um, one can disagree or not or agree, but one should see the difference. There is one. Um, they also depict Ukrainian nationalism as always hostile to both. As a historian, I have to say, that's where it gets extremely problematic. Um, they ban communist symbols and Nazi symbols, but they ban communist, including Soviet symbols, much more comprehensively, in a much broader way. Funnily enough, they do not ban the flag of uh, China, for instance. Uh, that's a wise decision, but it's certainly inconsistent once you have the spirit of these laws. They do also not ban um, symbols such as the Black Sun or the Wolf's Angel, which are both really, I'm sorry, Nazi and neo-Nazi symbols that are adopted, not by all, by far not by all, but by two of the volunteer battalions fighting for the Kiev government. If you want to consistently ban Nazi symbols, you have to ban those. If you don't ban those, you're not consistent. It's very simple. Um, they open and also strive to centralize the archive of the repressive organs of the Soviet regime, which is, of course, you know, first of all, a very impressive move. Um, they honor the fighters for Ukrainian freedom, and they prohibit disrespect for them. They prohibit disrespect for them and name it as unlawful. Um, they are also about the renaming of public spaces, essentially decommunization, desovitization, also getting rid of the remaining Lenin monuments, and so on, and so on, and so on. Right under these laws, Nipopetrovsk, which is named actually after a communist functionary, for instance, would have to be renamed. And the same thing is true for a lot of smaller places and public spaces, not only cities. Now, they also contain, and this is close to, to what we're talking about here today, instructions on how to commemorate World War II. And I've already uh, talked about some of the context here. It's important to say that this also replaces a much worse law of uh, 2000. Um, uh, I will not repeat what I've already said. Um, now, um, to be more... Um, specific about the laws and also explain why I think we are in the realm of what I would describe as the very problematic here. Um, law 2538 on the legal status and honoring of the memory of participants in the struggle for the independence in U of Ukraine in the 20th century. Article 6 says that public denial of the legitimacy of the struggle for Ukraine's independence is deemed desecration of the memory of the fighters for Ukraine's independence, denigration of the dignity of the Ukrainian people, and is unlawful. There is no specific uh, sanction defined here, but it is clearly defined as unlawful. The law also says that the Ukrainian Criminal Codex then, uh, needs to be referred to, and we don't know yet what shape this could take. Now, the problem with this is that, of course, in principle, freedom and independence fighters are to be honored, and it's every state's right. It makes perfect sense to honor such people. However, there's a long list of specific organizations. They begin with units attached to Ukrainian governments of the Revolution Civil War period. Uh, they go up to the Perestroika Glasnost time movement of Uruch, um, and they include Second World War nationalists, interwar nationalists, uh, the UUN and also the Second World War forces 
of the Uun, the Upa. Um, the Upa Uun relationship is a bit complex, but yes, the Upa is really the military wing of the Uun when it comes down to it. The problem with this, of course, is that both organizations um, were in their time, in their time, their changes over time, extremely right wing. They were proudly authoritarian. They had no time for liberal democracy. They were very clear about this as a lot of other people in Europe at the time, European politics, of course, of the interwar period, um, are extremely right-wing and getting ever more right-wing, so we are ma not making a specific point about Ukrainians here. But UUN in the interwar period, as Motil, Alex Motil said a long time ago, makes a radical turn to the right. There is an argument about how close to fascism this is, how we should define fascism, whether they are influenced by Mussolini more or by, uh, Don, uh, by uh, Nazism, what's the position of ideologues like Don Sof, where does the Uun Decalogue come from, what does its wartime program mean, and so on and so on. We could go into all of this. But the summary, the upshot really is that at least until 43, and I would argue beyond that, these are extremely right-wing, extremely authoritarian organizations. They fight for independence, they do not fight at that point for some sort of liberal democracy. And they would have found it, I think, quite insulting if you had implied that at that point. UPA and OUN are also engaged in massive ethnic cleansing of civilians uh, in Volin or Volinia, depending on what language you use, mostly of Poles. The current head of the um, Institute of National Memory of Ukraine, Volodya Yatrovich, is a historian. I personally think that he's not a good historian. He probably thinks the same about me, so that's okay. I've told him that too. Um, uh, is on record with works that massively, I think, uh, bias the record of this ethnic cleansing, essentially an attempt to describe it as a spontaneous form of equal warfare on both sides. It was not equal warfare. There were coordinated, politicized campaigns of ethnic cleansing involved in these territories. The second thing that makes them very problematic, UUN and UPA, is of course the fact that yes, they have an antagonistic relationship with both the Soviets and the Germans, but the relationship with the Germans is a bit different. There is an attempt to work with them, which is at least from the side of the UN very sincere. If the Germans in 41 had actually decided to use the Ukrainian nationalists, we would look at a sort of Ustasha regime in Ukraine, historically speaking. The reason why this didn't happen, it's pretty clear, is that the Germans were arrogant and thought they didn't need Slavonic allies or more Slavonic allies and therefore said no and actually put part of the leadership of UN into prison and concentration camps. Many people will again and again tell you this as proof that UU never had anything to do with Nazism. Historically speaking, this is unfortunately wrong. It is really more complicated than that. Even after this falling out between the Germans and the Ukrainian World War II nationalists, relationships remain complicated. And um, there is unfortunately also a certain degree of involvement in the persecution of Jews during the Holocaust. I can talk more about this in the, in the Q&A, if you wish. Um, now, here is a real question. If, um, will it be possible to speak openly and clearly about these things and controversially and have open debates in, in Ukraine about this without coming under somehow denying the legitimacy of the struggle for Ukraine's independence and the honor of these fighters, and they're explicitly defined as part of these fighters, such protected. Is it dishonorable to explain that an organization committed ethnic cleansing? I don't know. The question is how will the laws be applied? Now, the second law, 2539, on the perpetual commemoration of the victory over Nazism in the Second World War, it has many of the features that I've listed to you as, I think, positive developments. It also, however, explicitly prohibits, and I'm quoting here, the falsification of the history of the Second World War in academic studies, teaching, and methodological literature, textbooks, the media, public addresses, uh, by representatives of the authorities, bodies of local self-government, and the authorities. 
Um, this is clearly aiming at something that we know from Russia, I'm afraid to say that. Falsification of history is a Putinist strategy. Uh, who will define what is a falsification? And why do we need the state to actually have laws against this falsification and put this type of behavior, whatever it may be, even in <coughs> academic studies, under sanction? Wouldn't it be better if academics actually simply had debates and debunked each other? They can usually do this quite well. Then we have the law 2540 on access to the archives of the repressive organs of the communist totalitarian regime, 1917 to 91. Um, that, of course, is in principle an excellent idea. I personally hope that we will have similarly open access to all materials concerning, for instance, the Ukrainian police during World War II. And I know from my own experience that that access is de facto not open. Uh, the Ukrainian um, Association of Archivists has actually protested against this thing, not for political reasons, but they fear that the centralization process under the Institute of National Memory is basically institutional um, empire building and that it would also massively disrupt other archives. That's actually very likely. We will see what will actually come out of this. Then there is the fourth law, 2558, on the condemnation of the communist and national socialist Nazi totalitarian regimes and the prohibition of propagating their symbols. Now, this ban and all its subsections, it's very complex again, does not, does not apply to academic and educational materials, right? So there is an exception made here, which is stressed by defenders of the law and those who drafted it. However, it does not apply on the following condition that no denial of the criminal nature of the communist totalitarian regime of 1917 to 1991 in Ukraine takes place, also in academic studies. So there's a test now, according to this law, of academic material. It can only, um, it, can, it, it must not deny what this law calls the criminal nature of the communist totalitarian regime. Now that may seem simple, but it's not simple at all. How are you going to write, for example, about Petro Shelest? If you say anything um, positive about this particular communist leader who is often seen as a very ambi ambiguous and complicated figure who actually did a lot for, for Ukraine in his time and in his way, um, is that then denying the criminal nature of the whole regime since 17, 1991? Well, he was the party boss of Ukraine. If you write something positive about the indigenization or Ukrainization policies that preceded the horrible Stalinist slaughters of the 30s, are you then denying that the, that the regime was all the time 17 to 91 criminal? Once again, this seems to be a piece of legislation that really invites very serious complications. Um, to wrap up, um, I shouldn't take too much time. As I've said before, I do think that there are a lot of positive developments, and the best development for Ukraine is, of course, that it's generically moving into a much more pluralist direction, direction, and also that it persists, which is, of course, a very important factor in having your own history. If you persist, that in itself constitutes a major weight in developing your own history and identity. These are extremely important developments. However, you have to see that these laws could actually um, not only impede research and mess with the public sphere in Ukraine, with a pluralist public sphere, with the Western values that are so often invoked, they are also very polarizing. They are also not good for Ukraine in security aspects in a quite simple way. When you do a, recent, when you do a poll now, a very recent poll, uh, about what regions of Ukraine have majorities, majorities of respondents actually regretting the end of the Soviet Union. Once again, this may sound strange to us, but it's unfortunately a social fact on the ground. It's not only Donetsk or the part of Donetsk that's still under Ukrainian government control. It's also Kharkiv, Dnipropetrov, and Zaporizhia. That is, there are regions where there are majorities of people um, that do actually regret the end of the Soviet Union for one reason or the other, but that are actually very pro-Ukrainian as a whole. So this introduces a needless element of polarization. This actually becomes even more visible if you do polls on the position towards OUN and UPA, the Ukrainian World War II nationalists. 
the list of regions, many of them very pro-Ukrainian, pro-Kiev, still with majorities having negative opinions of these organizations is even longer. It's at least seven or eight oblasts, and it's definitely not only Crimea or the parts under separatist control. So it's no wonder that Halia Koinash uh, from the KPHG, which is a very important and usually very objective Ukrainian human rights organizations, far beyond any, uh, any uh, suspicion of serving Russian propaganda or being anti-Ukrainian or whatever you have, uh, has written already two articles against this. She has pointed out that similar attempts at legislation have failed in the sense that the European Courts of Human Rights and the EU's Venice Commission has attacked them in the case of Hungary and Moldova. And she rightly points out, and I would like to end on this quote, that, I'm quoting her here, the antidote to Russia's history and memory politics is found not in counter-propaganda, but in rejection of political interference in historical memory and total freedom for historical investigation. Unfortunately, these laws, if they are uh, signed, do, I think, not live up to that standard. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Thank you for organizing, and thank you for participating. Um, about 25 years ago or so, I went back to Poland, and I visited family and friends. My trip included locating some of my great uncles Guerrillas. My great uncle was a commando dropped from England into Nazi occupied Poland. And I found one individual, I mean, eventually many, but I found this particular person, his name was Marian Bobolewski, uh, who was 17 when he escaped from a Nazi camp. Then he joined the guerrillas, the outfit, in Lublin area and he told me that immediately when the Soviets arrived he was arrested he was tortured by the NKVD and a, an interrogating officer kicked him on his face and crushed his eye and so he said it after the liberation the Soviets grabbed me they tortured me and kicked me and I said and crushed my eye I said uh, Pan Bobolewski, are you crazy? You just told me after the liberation. Liberation means bringing freedom. And he started to cry. Why? Because for 50 years, the communists, through terror, forced him to acquire false consciousness. He was even unable to express himself. So what collective memories are we talking about? There are no collective memories under totalitarianism. Collective memories are generated from individual recollections expressed freely. And yes, Putin is right. Nobody talked openly. Nobody talked openly in front of the kids because the kids could snitch or just blurt something out. What we have is a process of creating collective memories that has commenced more or less since 1989 and afterwards. Under communism, the state imposed a uniform propaganda narrative through terror. The victorious communists supplied Stalinist words, concepts and images and symbols. Anyone who was not pro-communist was a fascist. Reductio ad Hitlerum was, a, was um, the rule. Right now we see a process, as awkward as it is, and I agree with most of what you said about Ukraine, a process of slowly allowing individual recollections to come to the surface and a tapestry to be woven out of all those individual recollections to create something resembling collective memories. 
And then what we have is uh, family level, where most people really don't know what the heck happened to their grandparents, great grand grandparents, even parents, because nobody spoke about anything. Everybody was scared, including Putin, apparently, and his family. And then when you look at regions and nations, as well as localities, well, the particular experiences had to have impacted individual recollections. So you will get a smorgasbord of memories. The Poles have it easy. There were two enemies. Hitler and Stalin never has ever, never has ever lived, never had, never, ne, never uh, any of them liberated anybody. That's quite clear for the Poles, but not for the Bulgarians. Hitler never did anything to the Bulgarians. In fact, he was very kind to them until, of course, the Bulgarians were invaded by the Soviets and forced to attack the Germans. So what kind of a individual recollection is that and what kind of a memory does that generate about the war? Completely opposite to the Poles. You look at, uh, you look at the Czechs, well, unless you're Jewish, and that applies almost everywhere except Bulgaria, you don't have much to complain if you're Czech. Czech, an average Czech worker, ate better than an average worker in the Reich. The Czechs really have nothing to complain about, as far as the Germans are concerned. Hence, one should be surprised at the ferocity of the Czech revenge following World War II against the civilian German population of the Sudetenland, etc. Well, the Slovaks emerged from the war with individual recollections which were both sympathetic and hostile to Germany. Well, Germany created the independent Slovak state, but then uh, it lingered on for too long, and part of the state, its military, uh, rebelled and joined the communists, the Soviets. So the Czechs don't like, I mean, the Slovaks don't remember the Germans too fondly as a result of this nor are they too happy about the Soviets who reincorporated Slovakia into Czechoslovakia. Because when you look at Central and Eastern Europe, when the giants were clashing, the dwarfs jumped at each other's throat. From the Hungarian and Romanian point of view, World War II was Hungary against Romania. It was not. Hungary against the Soviet Union. No, the Hungarians went east precisely so they could ingratiate themselves with Hitler more and could get more territory, which had been taken away from the historic kingdom of Hungary uh, by Romania mostly. Of course, Yugoslavia too, a little bit, and uh, Slovakia. There is, my point is that there is no uniform there are no uniform individual recollections, and there, there, there is no uniform narrative uh, uh, for that region. Look at Yugoslavia. In some places, including government places, today, you can see pictures of General Nadic. You know, I like Draža Mihailovic personally. I don't like Tito. But I was astounded to see Serbs preferring the collaboration is Chetnik. Why? Because the West betrayed them, sold them to the communists. And that's, that's that this is at least one of the narratives in Serbia. In Croatia, it's um, quite messed up too. They owe everything to uh, the German Foreign Office, meaning the independent st state of Croatia. The Ustasha were so ferocious that the SS complained about the uh, Croatian nationalist, ultra-nationalist atrocities against the Jews and Serbs. What kind of uh, individual recollection do we have there, or collective, when the Ustasha were, uh, had been a fringe, they were perfectly good, conservative, or, or 
populist, center-right collaborationists, which the Nazis wouldn't have. They preferred the old Stasha. And now the symbols returned, just like in Ukraine, you see, um, I, I even was told there were symbols of the Dirlewanger Brigade sported unofficially by a couple of outfits of volunteers fighting in uh, Ukraine. But uh, during the Balkan Wars, I saw SS Hanshar badges, that's the Muslim SS. I saw Prince Eugen SS badges. Everything is back, whether you like it or not. Why? Because it had been suppressed by the communists. In the West, it worked itself out. And unless you're a loser from uh, good in Paris, you don't wear anything neo-Nazi. And there may be 17 of them. There are 10 times as many Trotskyites, and no one is bothered. But somehow, when people emerge from an iceberg of totalitarian communism, they tend to make the same gestures as they had when they were frozen. So all the ugly stuff comes up. How do you do, deal with it? Well, one is to uh, attempt to bring back good memories. So good news uh, is that in um, the post-Soviet zone, we have a lot of anti-communism. The Poles march, young Poles march quite frequently to commemorate the heroes of the anti-Nazi and anti-communist resistance. In Poland, it was seamless. It wasn't like, say, in Ukraine with the 14th Waffen-SS or uh, the, the, the several SS divisions in the Baltics, which then some of the uh, soldiers became uh, underground far fighters, forest brothers. Well, in Poland was anti-Nazi fighters seamlessly moved into uh, the anti-communist direction right in 1944. You have split memories, split narratives. Finally, you have pl plurality. Even in Belarus, where uh, the local dictator worships Soviet par partisans, some of the locals in the West, rem and that includes Orthodox Belarusians, remember that they or their parents and grandparents had fought in the Polish underground home army. So that's what they remember in some of the regions of Western Belarus. Against the official narrative. Yes, in uh, Western Belarus, in some of the home army, Polish home army units, 80% of the troops were Orthodox and Belarusians ethnically. Their civic orientation was Polish. In Eastern Belarus, it's even more complicated. Uh, the official narrative of the Soviet partisans as a state ideology is so strong that it attempts to eradicate completely any local grassroots attempts to remember. And the most important one is Samozahova or self-defense forces that fought against the NKVD and Soviet partisans. Why? Because the Soviets were coming, raping, stealing, robbing food, and killing the locals. So, so in some of the places where um, NKVD and Soviet partisans during the Nazi occupation exterminated and burned villages, the locals remember and start putting up crosses. That's Eastern Ukraine. Very. Uh, good development, in my opinion. Uh, there are other competing narratives, some uh, of, uh, of um, amazingly, some of uh, Belarusian nationalists have discovered General Buak Balahovi. <coughs> he was a, ethnically, he was a Ruthenian. Of course, he was a Polish nobleman, but he was a part of the white Russian force to after, after Udenich was crushed by the Bolsheviks to continue in the field, he reinvented himself as a part of the uh, Green Oak and Ukrainian nationalist, I mean, Belarusian nationalist movement. This way, Marshal Piłsudski was not as angry with him. Now, Belarusian nationalists see him as a harbinger of independent Belarus. 
this is still an elite project, unlike the grassroots things I've mentioned. But all those things are coming out. A friend of mine, who was US ambassador to uh, Estonia, always used to uh, laugh at me, because I briefed her, I told her what to expect uh, from the point of view of current affairs and history. And, she's, uh, and she would say, oh, Marek, you're a historian. I said, yes, remember about the Estonian Waffen SS? Because for many Estonians, they were freedom fighters. There is a problem because some of the NCOs had participated in the Holocaust if they were in, uh, in uh, uh, police SS battalions. And that was usually uniform. But when the Germans began recruiting, the only permissible way to fight for Estonia was in the ranks of the SS. So expect there will be problem, there will be trouble. And she laughed. That's I think three days after she landed, someone unveiled a monument to the Estonian Waffen SS. Was it to glorify the Holocaust? No, it to glorify the fight against the communists. Same story in Latvia. And everywhere you go, across the Intermarium, the lands between the Black and Baltic Seas, what you see is both official and unofficial celebration of anti-communist guerrillas. So as, as I said, it is the least problematic in Poland, because they were both anti-Nazi and anti-communist. Uh, however, uh, in, in Lithuania, it is a state cult. Some of those people uh, did not acquit themselves with distinction in uh, Schuma battalions. In Romania, some of the elements resisting the communists in the Carpathians had been part of the Iron Guard. And what do you do with this? Well, if, we're for, if we approve of plurality, then let them celebrate. It doesn't mean I'm, I'm going to fall in love with uh, the 14th uh, SS Galician division at all. These are not my people. And how, but what are the Ukrainians to remember? Now, I would like them to remember the Count Sheptitsky, Archbishop of Lvov. But that's just me. I am a little bit torn when they want to remember Pablo Szandruk, who fought the Nazis in the ranks of the Polish army in 1939. But then he became the commanding officer of the 14th Waffen SS Division. The, he was released from a German POW camp. And in, in 1939, he was in the field in the same uh, unit with my great uncle. And he was shooting at the Germans. Shooting very well, too. Afterwards, <laughs> he was in the SS. So what am I supposed to do? Look at the Georgians. My uh, friends and others who were in the Polish cavalry, also in the Polish Bolshevik War, later fought the Germans in 1939. Uh, some, of, some of them decided to take their chances and join the Legion, uh, the, the Georg Georgian Legion to fight for Georgia. Why? Hitler gave them weapons and a chance. They thought they were coming back. And what are we going to say about that? Remember, after the attentat, after the assassination attempt on Hitler, all foreign units were shifted from the Wehrmacht to the SS. So in October 1944, an SS liaison officer arrived to supervise the Georgian Legion. So what are we to make of that? How are the Georgians going to remember anything? Even if you, if you look at Ukraine's history, they celebrate a Polish nobleman, Bogdan Chmielnicki, as their great leader. I can show you his coat of arms. They don't have anybody else. So I'm sticking with Count Szeptycki, the Archbishop of Lvov. It'll take a very long time. It'll take peace and freedom before, out of this mishmash, something emerges that they can all agree on. Thank you very much.
Q&A, and if, um, given that we're kind of short on time, if you could please um, limit your questions to actual questions. Uh, thank you very much. And can you state your name and affiliation as well? Thank you. Alexis Sabchenko. <clears throat> One quick question. Uh, how about Bosnians? Do they glorify Hajar division? Which was uh, you see, in wartime, Balkan wars, uh, there were no surveys. I saw the symbols. No, in present day Bosnia. In present day, right now, they glorify the Green Brigade, which is Al Qaeda. Okay. So I am really. Not too happy about either option. <laughs> the other question is, what Poles are going to do when, if Poroshenko sends the decree of glorifying people who slaughtered 60,000 Poles in Berlin? Uh, are they going they, to be... They already, they already uh, I think, uh, they already, the Ukrainians have already pff, committed a, f a few faux pas including on the, not the first, not the last one. Yeah, not the first, not the last one. Uh, and it's not just Volinia. This is a huge and, and horrific tragedy. Basically, the liberals keep quiet, and the, post, uh, and the post communists are split between national Bolsheviks and pinks. Uh, as far as the right wing, so called right wing, it depends. The uh, heirs to, uh, to the old Commonwealth also abet the Ukrainians and they, they try to look the other way. Unlike the Hungarians, the Polish, much of the Polish elites don't even pay attention to uh, the Polish minorities in the Intermarium. The, the only exception is uh, the current government has begun making noises about um, some of the Poles in Belarus. And, make, and making faces at Lithuanians without really doing anything. But they're not, unlike the Hungarians, the Poles are not touching any of this. It's, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a horrific question. Uh, about two weeks ago, a, uh, a, uh, uh, a novelist, a man of letters, said, well, let's admit there was ethnic cleansing, but there was also nation forming. I am not a fan of integral, uh, nas of integral nationalism, ethno-nationalism. I'm a great fan of nationalism, as in the US Olympic team beating the Soviets in 1980. It was the greatest orgy of nationalism ever in modern American history. That's, that's a kind of a thing I like. But uh, integral na ethno-nationalism means lack of solidarity in the intermarium. And there sh must be solidarity so we can enable the freedom fighter in Moscow. Hello, my name is Jan Sietan, and I work here at CTR. I'm, from, uh, I'm a visiting fellow from Finland. I would like to ask about uh, the winter war and how the perception in you know, Russia has changed during the past 25 years. Thank you. Yeah, so I have to admit that that's not um, an issue that I followed all that closely, but I will say that just as with the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, um, the impression is given is that somehow the Soviet Union was forced into taking these steps for national security, which is very similar to the old Soviet narrative. So I would say there has been very little change on the, on the Finnish war narrative. If I may, however, uh, at uh, another level, the Finnish war provides a great excuse to complain how the Soviet Union was unprepared. Also, the Putin regime arrested about and expelled about four months ago or so a Finnish historian who hitherto had been permitted to research and publish in Finnish. And then suddenly, must, in Moscow, must know Finnish, didn't like what the guy was publishing, and after 20 years, he was arrested, <laughs> accused, and ejected. So it is still very much alive. They're smarting from the masterful stroke by Marshal Mannerheim. 
actually Professor uh, Gobo who would not be here today because of sickness. Um, we have a video with him where he actually addresses the uh, soviet Finnish war um, at length. So um, we will post that uh, video. We'll show it and I'll post it on our website. Uh, thank you. Great discussion. Don Jensen, also from CTR Next Door. Can you say a word about Central Asian, the Central Asian uh, memory? Uh, in terms of our general discussion, and second, uh, the non-ethnic Russians, Russian citizens, so, uh, how that is remembered today, uh, if at all. Well, uh, perhaps Professor Goebel will speak to Central Asia as well, if he's rather more of our specialist on yeah. the uh, pieces of the- That he does not. Of the former <laughs> Soviet Union. Um, yeah, I can't really speak to the Central Asian part. I can say that in the early 90s, one of the parts of war memory that was really hotly debated was uh, this sort of outburst of nationalism that was seen as responsible in part for the breakup of the Soviet Union, that veterans were very vocal in saying, when we fought in the war, we didn't pay attention to ethnicity. We fought as part of the Soviet Union, so it was... I would say uh, a clinging to this partial, partially a myth, right, but of ethnic equality and lack of attention to ethnicity during wartime. And of course, one has to reconcile that with the treatment of the deported nations. But just like here, where our Japanese American soldiers fought at the front while their families were in internment camps, uh, you know, Chechens are deported to Central Asia, but Chechens who were in the army continue to fight at the front. So it's another one where you scratch the surface and you find that it's simply not very simple. And the question then is, you know, can one accept having a collective memory of the war that's not black and white, but that's full of clauses and the sort of things that historians love, but, you know, maybe uh, TV journalists not quite so much so. Concerning the Chechens, um, one might add actually that one of the, the one of the big myths of, of the one of the you know the one of the major myths of the of the great fatherland war actually uh, had to do with them the, the defense of the west fortress um, uh, a lot of the defenders were actually Chechens and that was something that uh, was only really coming out if at all after the end of the Soviet Union I think and and what what also came out was that uh, when the Soviet troops tried to fan out to meet the Germans at the outskirts of Brest, they were attacked by the local population, which in Brest itself was Polish <coughs> and Jewish. Uh, and that's also not a very well-known fact. Uh, as far as Central Asia, I, I can tell you almost uniformly, except maybe for Azerbaijan and, and then further north in the Caucasus, they hate the Mongols. In terms of collective <laughs> memories, I, I've heard more bitterness about the Mongols than uh, about Russia. I, I, I even remember talking, well, I mean, what's the difference? Well, why do you like the Russians? And, they, and historically, they would say, the Russians have great cannon. <laughs> and the Mongol, Mongols just destroy everything. So the persistence of, um, of I, I guess, this, uh, uh, fierce image of uh, step riders uh, is astonishing. Is there a national identity? Be because this is also a question of national identity. There are multiple identities. Uh, all of those people are post-Soviet. Uh, there, there are nationalist identities developing in Caucasus and elsewhere in Central Asia that I was able to, um, to, to, to look at. And it's, uh, it, it's frankly a post-Soviet project. Sometimes it's national socialist military type authoritarian, post-totalitarian. Uh, I don't know if everybody in Fergana Valley would say, oh yeah, this ethnicity, this nationality. Uh, when uh, the state is not ubiquitous clans and older forms of, of arrangement reappear. I wrote, by the way, my honors thesis on Soviet Muslims under Gorbachev about 30 years ago, and the only person who agreed with me was Paul Goebel, but Paul was classified, so I was alone 
<laughs> with Martin Melia, who allowed me to do crazy things like this. But anyway, Central Asia is a project in the making, in my opinion. The Soviets gave them the form of republics, and they are figure out, figuring out who they are. Even the Al-Qaeda is not the most extreme in the Caucasus. They can't, there, is, there are elements of the Islamic State now, so it's getting more and more crazy. Uh, Ken Meyer, Gordon Roldox. I read recently that uh, Russia is considering enacting uh, Holocaust denial laws like uh, are common in many Western European countries. What is the status of Holocaust revisionism in Russia and the Ukraine uh, these days? Is, is it as taboo a subject as it is in Western Europe and in this country? So I would say that uh, recognition of the Holocaust in Russia grew in the 2000s when I worked for the U.S. Holocaust Museum, uh, just uttering the word Holocaust in <laughs> Russia caused many puzzled expressions as people were at that point still not all that familiar um, with that term. But Moscow has a Holocaust Museum, there have been a lot more publications. Uh, how shall I say? So I think that the Holocaust does have a place in wartime memories at the official level now. Uh, and I would say that it's not the biggest area of sort of denial of bad things that happened in the past. I think that actually uh, denial about the purges is probably much more popular than Holocaust denial right now. Um, I haven't followed the state of the law itself, so I can't really speak to that. Um, yeah, um, with, with special reference to Ukraine, but, but one, one general remark perhaps first, you're probably aware that to summarize Soviet policy, which was also undergoing changes, but pretty ha had, a, had a great degree of stability, as it were, uh, between the Second World War and the end of the Soviet Union on the Holocaust. Um, it, yes, the Holocaust wasn't seen as the Holocaust the way we came to see it. And keep in mind, it took the West actually quite a while to come to the sort of understanding of the Holocaust that we now have, right? That's a historical development too. Um, but on the whole, Soviet policy never denied that it took place. There were very few exceptions. They can be exaggerated, but there are exceptions. Uh, what Soviet policy did on the whole was that it denied that it was unique. It denied it any special status. Um, that had to do with Soviet nationality policy. It probably had to do with residual types of a certain type of anti-Semitism that should not be confused with Nazi anti-Semitism inside even the Russian or Soviet leadership. You can find a little bit of that with Khrushchev if you want. Um, Soviet policy boiled down to um, uh, not denying that millions of Jews had been killed, but certainly not highlighting it, and quite often subtracting in a very strange move the ethnic identity from the victims. So you would somehow you would have a typical Soviet monument for the killing of Jews in a particular locality, would be a monument that would say, here the fascists slaughtered so and so many innocent civilians. And it was typical that they were not ethnically identified, by which, of course, you take out the special Nazi motivation that went into the Holocaust, and you also take out that this was actually indeed a special project even within all the other forms of inhumanity the German occupation brought to Eastern Europe. There are differences here, and they were flattened out by Soviet discourse. Um, in the case of Ukraine, um, nowadays, there is no strong milieu of Holocaust denial as such, strictly speaking, of, of anybody who would claim that, you know, this is all a hoax, it didn't happen, and so on and so on. That, that is not a major force. The, 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 the more complicated issue is that the glorification of the Ukrainian nationalist entails closing one's eyes, and often really aggressively closing one's eyes, to the degree of participation that unfortunately took place in the Holocaust. Um, 
some scholars have called this deflective denialism. I'm not sure about this term. I'm not very happy about it because I think it's something quite different from denialism. But there certainly is an issue. It has very well been described, by the way, by historian uh, Omar Bartov, uh, who has drawn our attention to the fact that it isn't really that simple. I, I, have, to, I have to say, you can't glorify and celebrate um, uh, the, the UPA and simply not think about the fact or pretend, pretend not to know the fact that so and so many of its soldiers came out of police units which before that had helped the Germans kill Jews. And this has been described by Tim Snyder. I think somebody who is very, very far removed once again from any sort of lack of sympathy for Ukrainian national interests, right? Although this article is less remembered in Ukraine now. Um, I, here in this particular respect, and, and similar actually with the Nachtigall Battalion or the um, Waffen-SS Division Galizien, which is a complicated story but not an innocent story, I'm afraid. Um, the, the, um, what I would like to stress in this respect is that I don't think I, uh, first of all, I totally endorse the, the, the call for pluralism, what you call the small gas board of, of memory and history. And I think this is inevitable. And yes, in a sense, it's inevitable that things like Waffen SS Division Galizien will be celebrated by some. But the problem is, if there is a pluralism and if, we need, if Ukraine needs time to work through this, then obviously it's not a good idea to let nationalists or neo nationalists hijack the process now, right? That's, that's exactly, we have to at least maintain the pluralism and the openness of the debate. And we have to keep in mind one other thing, which is we shouldn't essentialize. It isn't that simple, really. Also, especially in Ukraine, you can't simply say the Ukrainians want this, the Ukrainians want that. There are a lot of Ukrainians who do not want this sort of neo-nationalist memory politics. We may see them, we may not see them, but they're clearly there. You can poll them. You can find them among the intellectuals. Yes, the liberals are usually far too quiet, but we should be very, very careful not to allow people like Volodymyr Vertrovich, activists, to monopolize the idea of what Ukrainians actually want. Ukraine is really quite diverse in that respect, too, and that's a good thing. Thank you very much, and I guess uh, we'll end, uh, end there. And uh, if you could join me, please, in thanking our wonderful panelists for their great presentations. <laughs> Now join us uh, for a delicious lunch uh, provided by a wonderful restaurant in Gatesburg uh, called uh, Silk Road. Uh, at CGI, we strive for um, not just providing wonderful speakers, but also providing local and uh, cuisine <laughs> that you know suit, perhaps suits uh, suits the occasion. And we're always happy to support local uh, businesses. Again, thank you very much. And please stick around. Uh, shortly after 12, we'll start our second panel. Father thank you. Father was a colleague of my great-grand-uncle at the University of Stefan Batori.